We move on to our next stop in our second film from the 1928 class. April 21st, 1928, we watched as emotions were laid bare in The Passion of Joan of Arc. Directed by Carl Theodore Dreyer, this silent masterpiece unfolds the gripping tale of the legendary French heroine, Joan of Arc. Maria Falconetti's portrayal of Joan is nothing short of mesmerizing, capturing the intensity of her trial and in tribulations with an unparalleled emotional depth. Now, Dreyer's use of close-ups and stark cinematography created an immersive experience, inviting audiences to witness Joan's unwavering faith in the brutal trials she endured. The Passion of Joan of Arc stands as a cinematic triumph, a silent symphony that echoes the depths of human emotion and the enduring power of one woman's indomitable spirit. Prepare to be captivated by a film, a film that transcends the boundaries of time, leaving an indelible mark on the history of cinema. Nearly 100 years later, and this performance still stands out. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Passion of Joan of Arc. Will just watched this movie, this Carl Theodore Dreyer's uh, masterpiece, as I call it. Um, I was on pins and needles, excited to get his initial reaction since it's fresh in his mind. I watched this on Friday, and right before he was getting ready to answer it, it just it shut off on me. So here we are again, take two. Will tell me once again if you loved it, if you hated it, your initial reactions to the Passion of the Joan of Arc. Yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> you you were selling this as a uh, as a great movie. Um, you said the performance was something to die for, and I completely agree. Um, I was I was so impressed with the performance. I was so impressed with the way the movie was shot. Um, the the close ups on faces was just you know driving the tension up and really making you feel what she was feeling. Uh, Mar uh, yeah, Maria Falconetti and. Um, you know, there's some techniques used towards the end of the film, like with the, the fading of the camera that were, I just was so impressed with. Um, and, you know, this was this was a great movie. The first I think the first great one we've watched. Yeah, I, I remember talking to you last week about, you know, Kylie asked me if I like these movies. And I remember saying to you that they're not really about liking them. They're about education and learning just the kind of the history of film and where they came from. I'm right. with you. This is the first legitimate, this is how rewatchable for me. Like not only mm. is it something you can study, but like this is genuinely the performance here stands to the day, modern day for me. Like there is there, you know, is there repeats to like a, the same type of shot over and over again? Sure. But it's when you learn how this was done in production, when you learn right. her, uh, Maria Falconetti's limited film, um, um, IMDB or credits, it's mm -hmm. even more impressive because it just, she, she initially jumps off the screen right away when she comes in and they do, like you said, these, these close ups of, you know, I, I seen it from shoulders up, um, or just the intensity in the eyes. That's where she's telling the story. And Carl does a great job of <clears throat> just focusing, not just on hers, but all of the players in this movie just focuses right there on the story. And the story is the reaction um, to the, right. her, you know, their line of questioning. So I, dude, I love that you love this. Oh yeah. No, I was definitely, I was, as the movie was going on, I kept being reminded of, you know, different, different films and just how you could see, you could see this was the template for a lot of things that come after, um, you know, it, not just in the performance. Like I think, you know, one of the things I was just writing my letterbox review uh, while we were getting ready here. And, you know, one of the things I said was <clears throat> all performances come back to this. Like, I, I I haven't watched a ton of movies before before this movie. I'm sure she was drawn on some things uh, herself. But, you know, like when you think about a great performance that can make a movie, this this clearly has an influence, you know, throughout throughout film history. Well, I'll give you one of the pre-production notes now. Maria Falconetti, this was her second 
and last film she ever did. She was mm-hmm. a, a stage actress. She was known for theater, and there's not a lot written about her. But what mm-hmm. they do know is that, like, it, it, it almost feels like she w- appeared out of nowhere, did this film, and then went back to nowhere and then disappeared because there's not a lot written on her in her life either. Um, mm-hmm. To think about how a, a theater or stage actress has to portray herself on stage, it's a lot of bigger picture thinking, right? It's full body. It's thinking like the the audience sees all of you in all of the space around you. So the reactions on the face aren't that necessarily that important because it's not like it's modern day Broadway where there's a camera on you and the whole, the whole room can see it. It's, it's, it's old, right? So there's not a, they're not projecting anything onto a, a screen there here for someone to have that type of experience and then come into this movie and it just everything be right here in the way she tells the story, dude. I just I'm blown away and blown away even more when I read that about her. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was just an incredible performance. And, you know, the kind of thinking we were off off air a little bit. We were joking about like, you know, the Oscars <laughs> start in 1929. And I said something like, you know, they started the Oscars so they could reward people for this type of performance because um she she really transcended um i think there are some performances that you can think about that in films that you've watched where the person so fully embodies the character that yeah. um they become that character for you um and you know it, it helps here that she only ever did like one leading role like this where she is Joan d'Arc and you know i think i think that's how i'll think of her I, you know, because of that. Yeah. And, you know, we're getting ready to do, you know, a hundred years of cinema here. And I, I will, I might forget the Eugenie Bessessers of the world, unfortunately, <laughs> you, you know, the mother from the jazz singer, I might forget that, um, which I don't want to, that's the whole point of this, but I know I will not forget Maria Falconetti because the performance, it, it stands the test of time. Um, and not just here, but like in my mind, I remember 20 years ago when I saw this for the first time, I I wish I had more of a, uh, an ambitious nature then to want to learn more about the film that I watched. Um, interesting note, I watched this movie for the first time in Lillian Gish's theater. And if you don't know Lillian Gish is, she was an American actress, kind of the first lady of actresses that they called her. That was kind of her moniker. Um, and her name was attached to the Bowling Green Theater. So they, they named the theater after her. So she's got a lot of her stuff there. Um, interesting enough, the uh, the some of the people wanted Lillian Gish to play this role. So it's mm. just kind of a, a small, weird connection that I have to Mary, or Marie Falconetti through Lillian Gish that I'm sitting in the theater that sh- Lillian Gish made popular and she was up for this role. Pretty cool story, you know? And it yeah. didn't connect yeah. with me until after I saw the movie. I was like, oh my God, that's the theater. So anyways, yeah. outside of this, outside of her performance, the movie itself, now I know she carries the performance, but that that that, that doesn't mean that some of the other names and actors and, and Carl Dreyer, the way he told the story, what did you think of the kind of the story structure, the narrative um, from beginning to in my opinion, the last 10 minutes of that movie are just incredible. You know what they tell you in the beginning, you know what's going to happen and then you watch it play out and you're still mouth dropped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, I was, I was really taken aback by how much close up there was. There were even a few moments when, uh, the lead Bishop, um, I'm pretty sure it was the lead Bishop, uh, in the movie, um, where he the camera was kind of like looking up like it was almost like looking up at him and he does this thing with his face where his eyes almost protrude out of his face like he's you know he's dropping he's dropping the facade of being this you know loving bishop and really kind of showing his true colors almost like flushing out the, the good and showing what what his real intentions are and that's to keep keep his power structure um, and you know, I thought that was incredible. Um, the, <clears throat> the line right before the, 
you know, pandemonium starts at the end of the movie where uh, he, you, you just burn a saint. Um, I thought that was really powerful stuff. Um, and really, you know, and we'll probably talk more about this later, but I'm really excited to talk about the, this, this type of story. And because it's my favorite type of story, the, the struggle with God and what, what we, what we're always trying to connect with and how that has played out in film over the last, you know, 30 or 40 years, which I've seen a lot of those movies. So, yeah, I, no, that's interesting. I actually didn't even think about going that route. I, I'm going to write that down. We'll come back to that. Um, I wanted to kind of go back to your original point of the way he was shooting it. Um, these low angles up close ups. Yeah. One of the things I found in pre-production and just my research was that Carl made these actors and obviously actresses wear no makeup, which during the time of silent film is just something you didn't do. And the reason he did that is because he wanted, especially with the, 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 the bishops and the, the clergymen, he wanted them to have all of their monstrous, um, facial mm. features pop off the screen, but not just that their their actual facial imperfections. So like the guy had a couple moles on his face. Mm -hmm. Those things really, I know we probably are watching HD remastered footages of this as best that we, we can, but like yeah. they really popped off the screen and they're in your face to, to go along with that type of anger. And you're like, man, this, it really just helps sell, especially the silent film. Um, even yeah. more so. So like, yeah, those, those angles were done on purpose, obviously. And the other thing I read was that he was shooting kind of crooked a little bit. Um, mm. and he had high contrasting light on, on the judges and the bishops so that you got more of their grotesque features. But when it mm. came to, when it came to shooting Joan, it was softer light, a warmer okay. feeling. So obviously, and you know, it's just stuff like that, that you don't think about when you're watching a movie. The director really is directing an emotion out of you. He is right. probing and pro poking you in directions that he wants you to go. That's why he's in charge. And sometimes you don't really give them enough credit. You think they're just kind of, hey, actors go stand and then the actors do their part. And we, we glorify actors a lot, which in this case, there's mm -hmm. a reason for it. But I really think Carl Dreyer, you can see his genius on screen here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, there's... There's a lot of things um, I, I hadn't really made that connection yet about the lighting, um, but kind of thinking back to it and the way their their features are, are popping off the screen um, really kind of gives, especially, I'd be interested to rewatch this and look at, um, there's a couple of the, the younger uh, priests uh, that kind of are more sympathetic. Um, yeah. to see kind of how they're shot, uh, to see if that, that light kind of plays the same way. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, I, I have a couple. I had a couple questions watching this that I mm. might have missed. Um, I just, just for setup purposes, were, did you know that these bishops were they were French, but they were in favor of the English? Did you did that? Did you pick up on that anywhere? Um. <clears throat> only because I kind of I have a, I had a little bit of pre-existing knowledge about okay um, about the situation about Joan Arc so um, <clears throat> I hadn't I read a little bit a bit about it after to kind of really remind myself of um, you know the the English and the French tension because the the King King Charles was referred to a few times in the movie obviously um, yep. so um, yeah no I. What, that was one part that, as I, the movie kind of went on, I I started to remember that there was that tension there between the English and the French. <clears throat> well, that's where this movie kind of starts, right? Is sure. there was this this war between the English and the French, and you had this nineteen year old Joan who is a soldier, um, a leader. And she has been given the word of God um, that the French will have a great victory and will be uh, pushing England out of France. And she believes that she is not just got the word of God, but is the daughter mm -hmm. of God. And mm -hmm. that's kind of where this movie takes place. We, we see the opening shot. And I wrote this down because I kind of thought um, I kind of thought it was 
just really well done. It was that opening shot, left to right pan, and it just keeps going and going and going, and it sets the scene right away for not just one bishop, but all these bishops, all these judges sitting in a room waiting for Joan of Arc to kind of be brought in. And when Mm -hmm. we see her, we see a close-up of someone in shackles, um, kind of these softer edges on the outside, and she walks in. Obviously, she's a prisoner. And that kind of sets the tone for this for this movie. I wanted to hit you with some uh, pre-production notes real quick. Sure. Took Carl Dreyer one year of prep and research work prior to writing the screenplay. Okay. So he got his hands on the actual documents. He was invited by the French, and I forget the name of what they film, you know, kind of mm-hmm. uh, uh, organization. He was invited to come in and make a film. And it came down to one of three films. It was one on Marie Antoinette, um, one on this, and then there was a third choice. And uh, ultimately, he came and found this film, and he wanted to do it. A lot of pushback after this movie comes out, and we'll get to that later, from French nationalists because a Danish man, a guy from Denmark, did this movie. They didn't think that he would have the right kind of tact to do this type of film. Um <laughs> But you'll learn that Carl Dreyer wasn't going to take no for an answer on a lot of the things he did. We'll get to that later. Um, Antonin Artaud, he plays one of those younger monks. Okay. Okay, one of those younger monks that you were talking about that was kind of seen to be an empathetic uh, judge. He later to state, he, he went on record to state that this film was meant to reveal Joan as the victim of one of the most terrible of all perversions. The perversion of a divine principle in its passage through the minds of men, whether they be church, government, or what you will. And that, I wanted to read that one because it ties into this greater conversation that I think you and I are going to have once we get done getting through the movie. Um, Mm. I I just thought that was kind of a great line that I came upon, don't you think? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, There's definitely, you know, there's the underlying... (laughs) The one issue that, you know, I might minor nitpick I have about about the character, right, is that if the film is still shot from the perspective that there is there is a God that someone is right about. And, you know, I think in 1928, that was a bit more of an accepted uh, principle of the world. Um, and, you know, definitely in 1640, uh, 1620 or something like that when Joan Arc was, yeah. 14, 14, 14, 19. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, the uh, that I think is my minor, like, small nitpick, right? It's still taking for granted that concept that God is real and not trying to argue that God is not real. But, you know, I, I just think there's some steps we got to take and conversations we got to have about that. But anyways, as far as, um, I want to pin that, but I do want to come back to it because it is an interesting stance, right? But it does talk about the society piece that you and I, we we love to bring to the show here. So go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, that, that was kind of, that was kind of it. Um, I think I still, I still think that that struggle, right. The struggle between, um, the people who use God for to maintain power versus what is actually good um, is, you know, alive and well in this movie. Um, So regardless of who or what she's driven by, like really, um, I I think that it's still poking at that concept of the institution kind of having some, uh, you know, some maybe not actually having what they think they do which is a connection to connection to God. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. You would think as clergymen, um, and then we'll get in the movie, but you would think as, as our our bishops Mm -hmm. and people who claim to understand and and know how to interpret the word of God, or maybe even been spoken to, um, would be more humbled by the fact that God has chosen more than just them to mm. share a message to or to lead an army to. You know what I mean? There's yeah. also the uh, the contrast of 
this taking place on a war, on a battlefield, right? Uh, and, yeah. and whether or not, where does God fall in, in that whole conversation too, right? But right. let's get to the movie. Mm-hmm. Carl Dreyer shot this in chronological order. He thought it would lend to the effect of helping the the actors get to where they needed to be. Um, I spoke already about the opening shot, uh, just kind of to, to set the stage. Mm-hmm. What I what I kind of took from the opening scene through that first line of questioning back and forth, you know, it was these kind of very general statements. They asked uh, Joan about whether or not if she knew the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> and right away she says she does, but she would not want to recite it. And I, I took that as, you know, that's a personal connection between not just her and God, but a personal connection between her and her mother because her mother <clears throat> taught her the Lord's Prayer. So uh, right away you get some exposition on the movie um, that – that within the first five minutes is the setup of there of maybe what her motives might be. Um, I thought, and maybe you took it differently, but it felt like the, the theme was throughout this movie, it almost felt like they were setting her up, right? Which they were. They would ask sure. her these questions and they were looking for her to answer them a certain way. And mm-hmm. then she almost responded to them like they would respond to anybody asking hard hitting questions, not our hard hitting questions, but in general, you know what I mean? Um, every time she would give them the kind of perfect response, the perfect vague response to their questions that seemed to anger them more. Did you pick up on that? Was that kind of the theme throughout or am I missing something? No, you're, you're absolutely right on the, you know, the lead into these questions, you can see the looks on their faces when they're asking them, right? You can see them kind of, kind of laughing under their breath or thinking, hey, this one's really going to get her like, or, you know, in early on in those first couple scenes, she's really they're The priests are really, they're certain they're going to get her right They're They're certain that she's not going to be able to handle their questioning because, you know, they're experienced, you can, they're all, you know, in their 50s and 60s, you can see that pretty clearly. So the contrast between um, youth and, uh, you know, old age, and then the way they just, they smile, and it's all very, you know, uh, uh, cavalier at the beginning. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it kind of leads into those questions, and then you're right, the anger starts to build and build as they get through that first, you know, that first round of questioning. <clears throat> Well, she does seem to find a sympathetic uh, uh, figure right away. We kind of get that in the first uh, first mm-hmm. act for sure. Um, this one kind of confused me because they kind of look similar. I, there was a couple judges to me that kind of looked similar. Yeah. We get someone through the first line of questioning. We, we get a, a bishop or a judge to stand up and say that they believe her to be a saint. And mm-hmm. from from that moment on, we're led to believe that this person is going to steer her um, as much as he can down her path of righteousness of what she believes. Mm-hmm. Um, is that the same person that was – this part I, I got no. a little confused on. No. That's Sorry, not the I was same person at- that was betraying yeah. her later? No. So I was looking at IMDb to see if I could get lucky and see okay. the faces because some of them, you know, this is so old. Only Did some you of the, have the same thought as me? Are, okay, go ahead. I I think they're two different priests. I think the okay. one that really stands up and calls her a saint does leaves. I think that's what happens. Okay. And then there's another one who is kind Pens of like, the letter yeah, from King Charles. Yes. Those are two different people. I th- I'm almost positive. Okay. Yes. That changes the movie so, a little bit, you know, because yeah, I so, thought at first I thought he was an, you know, an innocent guy. And then I started sitting here and I got a little confused. I was like, holy crap. He only said that just so he could kind of get her on her side to, to get her to atone and to, you know what yeah. I mean? Repent. So, okay, right. good. I'm glad you said that. That makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're meant to kind of take that as a, as some of the political undertones, right, of the film where um, you've got the English uh, invasion of France and you've got the response from France and yet you have uh, a Catholic church that is trying to both be on be on both sides. Um, okay. And what I, th- I think that's meant to kind of signify is that there is there are priests who are siding with what they think is right and there's a, there's a separation happening there. 
Um, so yeah, I think that that initial priest, we don't see him again. I think we're meant to think like, Hey, you know, he's, he's no longer on, on this English side of the, the Catholic church. Okay. Fair enough. Cause I was, I was thinking that uh, he had turned on her and left her because there is a priest where she's like kind of looking for in the middle of the film to like lean her into the right direction with answering some of the questions or whether or not she should sign things of that nature. I thought that was the same guy, but then ultimately, okay, I'm glad we, we kind of had that same type of confusion. Um, we're now at the 11 minute, 19 second mark. Kylie is officially asleep. We move on to the next, we move on to the next scene. Um, Great symbolism. She's moved to the prison. Uh, she's in her cell. And uh, there was great symbolism, just the way I thought it, I just thought it was worth noting. The cross, you know, the sun hitting the cross and it being on the floor. And it kind of giving her renewed energy and purpose that, you know, validation that what she is saying and believing and feeling has happened is correct. Um, yeah. And then obviously we have the next line of questioning. So... Anything that stood out to you in this scene before we kind of get to the, the, the act two? No, no, I think, I think you're right to that scene is meant to kind of give us the, the reaffirmation of her, um, her very strong beliefs that um, she's acting in the name of God here. So then we get to the middle of the movie. We're in act two and they're still trying their tactics. They're, they've now taken her to the torture chamber. And this was, this was shot very well, dude. Oh, yeah. I don't know what your thoughts were, but the, the clergyman spinning, the kind of what, I don't know, like a wheel of spikes, mm -hmm. um, just basically trying to use all these scare tactics that they possibly can on her. Um, but the way, and I, I wrote a note here, it was this quick, kind of quick shots, um, Quick shooting back and forth with the music. The music really stood out. Now, I will say this in note to the music. I don't think we're ever really catching the real original music that was played during. during. I've learned that that opening soundtrack is called The Voices of Light by Richard Einhorn. That was put in 1995. Okay. And that's disappointing because it's so powerful, right? It works, yeah. but it's it's not. I, yeah. I, so I'm just going to take it the rest of the way that the soundtracks probably aren't a hundred percent, you know, the original works of, of music. So, but it sure. worked though. So let's talk about this, this chamber scene. What, what stood out for you within the uh, torture room? Yeah, it was the, it was the quick cutting, right? That's, that's another thing that we see, you know, as we go through, <clears throat> as you go through film and you go, you know, not just into, you know, it's kind of a borderline horror tactic, but more like a thriller, like a psychological thriller. You see the quick cutting to the the terrifying thing, and then back to the the actor or actress and their their way they're reacting to things. And it's meant to drive that tension up to make you feel like you don't know what's coming next. And um, yeah, I I thought that quick cutting was was really well done. Do you think, uh, on some semblance or some sense, that this is kind of a horror film oh yeah there's definitely some in there um i mean that last uh, from the from the time she is up on the the stake um i mean oh. there's definitely some horror going on for sure oh yeah um, for sure reminded yeah. me of uh well now it didn't in the movie it just now does do you remember um oh what was that movie uh oh it's actually there's a horrible scene in it but um so the, 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 they're, they're in a trailer. Um, guys come into the trailer and they, there was like two of these movies in the early okay. mid two thousands. Um, like Hills so, have eyes? say it again. Hills the, have the, eyes? I don't know. Is it, That's... is it the Hills have eyes where the, so the girl gets raped in the trailer and then they burn her father out. Mm -hmm. Is that the Hills have eyes? Um, that might, that uh, might there's, be. there's a, not, there's like a B movie called I spit on your grave. Is that what you're talking nah, about? I would never watch that. I, yeah, I'm not even sure why I watched this first one, but I just remember that scene being like, holy smokes. That was, that was an intense, powerful scene. Um, okay. I'm not sure the necessity of it, but it was definitely worked in that movie. Um, getting okay. back to this, yeah. I, I, uh, I'm with you, man. Just the quick shooting, the way they told that story. She ultimately ends up feigning and they take her out of the room. Um, because mm. 
at this point in the movie, they're trying to get her to renounce what she believes and what she's saying out loud. Do you believe any of these outside of the ones that we were showed that they had compassion for her and believed, whether they believed her to be a saint or not, they had compassion for her. Was there any part throughout this movie where these judges were like begging her to renounce it so that because they they maybe they felt the pressure yeah. of like saving face for the church and with the people at the masses at large is there any part of you that believes or is this just the power grab the whole time yeah i mean you can see there are some of the the priests uh in particular the one that ends up getting her to sign uh the paper uh, and then also the younger priest that keeps kind of coming back or is holding the um, the law, I can't remember the name of those. I'm not Catholic. So, but the long, the long oh, state. Way to put me on the spot. Well, I was, uh, I, yeah, but put me on the spot. I'm not Catholic anymore. I mean, in my adult life, I was, uh, you know, I had, I was raised Catholic. I should know what those are, but I don't. So we'll just put it there. Yeah. Anyways, the, the, the long stake with the, the cross on the end, uh, he was there the whole time and you could see it on his face that, um, he was very, he didn't have much to do with the decision making anyway, but um, you could tell that he was feeling very uh, poor, you know, in that, in that scene, he was not, not happy about what was going on. And he was definitely, it was unfortunate. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, it's, I think it's important that there were these moments of, of some kind of inner conflict between the judges and the bishops so that the movie isn't just portrayed as, and I think that's another level of genius and, and, and probably because it's historically accurate too, I'm sure. Um, but just, it wasn't just everybody on one side, good versus evil. There's, there's grace to this story. There's complexities, yeah. you know, just because, sure. you know, you know, it's kind of like the, the Pope Francis now, you know, he's done a lot of things that the traditional church would be against, um, mm -hmm. you know, opening up conversations with transgender people, you know, uh, accepting gay people to, you know, have their feet cleaned and, and, and gay couples and, and, and saying there's a space for them in, in, in church. And, you know, that's, that's the highest level of, 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 you know, Bishop there is in this, in this world. And it just, you wouldn't think that would exist with the way the traditional ways are done. So I just thought that was interesting that they continue to tell that kind of contrast. Sure. Yeah, no. And you could, you could see that it was a, a minimal opinion, but I also think um, one of the things that is helpful here is to re remind ourselves that this is one, you know, one small sect of the church that is trying to, you know, do something politically. Um, which is why I think, you know, Dreyer is probably trying to say something political here in that, um, you know, this isn't really about God, you know, for the, those priests. It, it's not. It's, it's about maintaining their power structure and trying to be on the right side of history. So I, 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 I remember thinking when I was watching it, just how surreal, like the whole idea of this is, this is, you know, <clears throat> 600 years old. 500 mm -hmm. years old and obviously this isn't even the first recorded power grab in history but just the fact mm -hmm. that you know we're still experiencing not just within government but at the mm -hmm. church level it is continues to be about a power grab you know and it's just so contradicting to what the origin of the purpose of these things were supposed to be at least maybe, sure. maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's, maybe that's, maybe I'm wrong in that statement too. Maybe the origin purpose was for, you know, evil and, and brainwashing and things of that nature. But Chris, I mean, Christian, Christianity is, if you're going to critique one of them, Christianity is the one to do it. Um, sure. It's origins are pretty, pretty mucky and, and gross, but yeah. Yeah. Well, we move on. She's back to the prison. Um, they, she's asked if she, you know, they're, they're going to offer her the Holy Sacrament. Um, and, uh, but the, the deal is if she's going to attend mass, she has to once again, wear. they wanted to wear women's clothing. That was very gender was very much a, a theme in this movie. 
Um, oh, yeah. And uh, they, once again, she she rejects that uh, that premise. She's not going to do that. Um, therefore, uh, the judges, I believe this is the same scene. This is the body of Christ. They were trying, mm -hmm. and because she refused to do that, they said, you refuse to take the body of Christ. You refuse to accept. Um, let me just read what I have here. Uh, her refusal to sign the paper. This is where they're trying to get her to sign the paper. This is the hmm. first time trying to get her to sign the paper of her that renounce or denounces the voices that she is hearing. Um, and once again, they get mad and they claim that she'd rather lie than take the body of Christ. So that was this moment here. Anything that stood out to you? Um, or is it just more of the same, just another tactic of trying to get her to ultimately do the thing that they want? Yeah, no, I mean, you can see, you can see the priests also becoming more and more desperate, right? They're, they're, every time we get to a new tactic, they're, they're hoping that this one's going to be the one that works. And when it doesn't, you can see, you know, not just their frustration, but they're, they're coming to terms with the fact that they might have to actually burn this woman at the stake to keep their word. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know this story outside of what I've watched. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're going through. So my research tells me that there was like 80 different conversations spread out over a long period of time that dryer took and condensed down into one day's worth of act, right? So mm -hmm. all of these conversations and tactics that happened from, from these bishops and judges to with Joan of Arc uh, didn't take place all in one day. He, he took liberties right. with that, for obviously, for the story. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, is, it must have been a very public trial. Is that fair to say? That oh, yeah. they were up against it with the masses because the masses did believe her to be some semblance of a mm -hmm. saint. Um, and they couldn't just send her straight to the stake for refusing. They had to kind of play this political game with her because of the masses. Is that, is that fair? Am I, am I right? No, <clears throat> no, you're right. You're right here. Um, there's the one thing that's kind of unmentioned here is there's a, um, it's been a while since I read on this, you know, in depth, but there was, <clears throat> there was a period of time when, she the initial victory that she kind of drove uh for the french against the english uh there was a time between that and then the trial right of joan d'arc right there was that victory and then there was a series of losses that she she had and this was you know charles had um, asked her to do these, I can't remember the places or I, I, I'd, I'd let you know, but, um, there was a couple different places where she failed. And the last one is where she's captured. And then this is, you know, we pick up where she's, um, it at trial. So, um, you know, that, that series of failures also comes with some lost, I don't want to say faith, but lost confidence from Charles to her. So there's right. also that tension where she she has started to fail. So you can see, I think that um, Falconetti is really kind of picking up on that, like, not just am I actually hearing the voice of God, but does he actually care about me? Like, all these things that I thought were real, are they actually real? And that's yeah. that extra bit of tension that we're seeing on her face right now at this point yeah. in the movie. Man. Just hearing you say that and thinking back to the image that's behind me right now and just thinking back to the way Falconetti played with that space is, mm -hmm. dude, it's goosebump worthy. It's really, yeah. it's really an incredible performance. Um, For sure. Okay, so at this point, we're getting ready to get to the end here. Uh, they now believe she's the devil. Um, mm -hmm. Blasphemy yelled out a thousand times over. We're getting ready to get to the execution scene. Um and right before they try to execute her, so there's this great kind of symbolism again that Dreyer plays with. They're digging the grave. Out comes the skull. Uh, inside the skull, you see either the maggots or the worms or whatever it is. Um, she's really getting beaten down. That The fear is really starting to set in that she's going to be burnt at the stake. She's questioning all those things that you said she was questioning. And then we see the one saint who's kind of been 
trying to get her to sign the paper. She signs the paper. Mm-hmm. And the the masses at a whole see this. Um, and now she's taken back inside the prison cell where they remind her and let her know that she is now going to live a life in prison for mm-hmm. her, um, I forget the word that they use, but for her uh, atrocities to not just the church, but to, you know, for war. So um, yeah. anything to mention there before we get to the last 10 minutes of this movie? Um, I don't think so. I thought the the skull was really interesting choice. Um, you know, one might say in 2023 that that's a little on the nose, um, but I I thought that it really worked here. Um, you know, I'm 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 okay with decisions that feel on the nose if they're genuine, um, and I think this whole movie just kind of reeks of being genuine. So um, I thought that was an interesting choice, and I think it really worked to kind of have that skull being buried by by the dirt. Yeah. And I think in 2023, we've seen a shit ton of movies. So we are an educated audience, right? In 1928, they don't have that type of, you know, education or knowledge. So it has to be more spoon fed and in their in direct in their face to kind of get the symbolism. That's why it, it is over romanticized for our taste. But like sure. you said, genuine, authentic, like reasoning behind it makes sense. So, yeah, yeah I'm right there uh, with you because it, it felt a little. I was like, oh, okay, but it, yeah. I got it. It worked for me too. Yeah, and it's one of those things as a reminder to myself, like, hey, like, you know, you've got to dispense with some of your preconceived, um, the things that you're coming into this with, because sure. you know that wasn't possible then. So that's all. yeah. Yeah, especially in for a silent movie too, you know. You get into a talkies where you can kind of verbalize more exposition, it gets a little easier. Um okay, she's back in the prison. She has once again she sees the kind of the crown being swept up and taken away from her. She panics. I don't want to say panics, but it overcomes her that she has repented. She's lied. She's she's now wants to get the judges back around to let them know that she indeed did hear the voices um and the she repents and the death sentence is imminent and there we go the young monk comes in starts prepping her for the death scene there's this great kind of poetic like transition scene of them cutting her hair um uh just basically the whole look at the end that if you not not that they didn't do a good job already of making her look beaten down as it was now they cut sure. her hair even shorter and it's spotty and it's just this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, just powerful. Just powerful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, um, you know, this is one of those <clears throat> moments where you can really tell the director is thinking about this thing fully because you get the shots. You get you get to see what her, not just what she looks like when her hair is short, but you really get an idea of what of her like silhouette and what she looks like because that's really important with the way he shoots the the final scene yes with her on the yep. stake. Yeah. yeah no because you're right when, it is when she's on the stake and you're looking at it it's it feels real you know what's going on and whatever is you know actually burning there i mean it could have been her i guess because she never did another movie <laughs> but um and there's not much to tell yeah <laughs> yeah no um but I'm putting that down as hard-hitting burning. question number three. Did Dreyer actually kill her in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. But, um, yeah, no, it's really important because that whatever is burning in there really has that same exact silhouette and, and profile um, yeah, yeah. Of, of Falconetti. So he's really setting a, a tone here, setting, a st- setting the stage for what's to come. Dude, you're right, Will. That is so brilliant. You're right because without this scene – we don't really get a sense of what her physical stature is. You're right. We need this scene. Dude, that went over my head. Great catch. That was a great catch. Yeah, because that really makes that lasting scene more impactful because we know it. Obviously, we know it's her, but it it just makes it connect even more. Yeah. Wow. Great, great call on that. Um, I wanted to mention this. I thought it was great. Uh, 
um, great writing, I guess. I guess, yeah, you can have writing in a, in a silent, right? There, there's still those titles. Um, I, when, when prepping for the, for the death scene, the younger judge goes into her cell to prepare her for death and ask her a question. What is the great victory? She replies with my, and I'm going to butcher this word, but my martyrdom, my martyrdom. Mm -hmm. And then he replies to her once more and says, in your freedom, death. And yeah. it's powerful because then yeah. now we're sitting into the execution scene where everything just goes bonkers. Like not just this, this figure through the movie who we are now overly attached to, yeah. regardless of your belief system, you're human. Mm. You're watching a human that believes wholeheartedly, whether she's right or wrong, she believes. And, mm. and to watch somebody, there is a level of admiration for people who go forward with what they believe to be righteous. Um, sure. And in this case, you have this incredible scene of, Shots of logs burning, birds flying. I thought the birds flying was really good, really well done. Um, people's crying faces, Joan's face as smoke engulfs her, uh, the rebellion against the church, the actual showing of the flames engulfing her body like you talked about, and basically just an all-out war between the townspeople and the church guards. Um, anything left out? Uh, just an powerful scene, man. It went on for about 11 minutes. It, was, it reminded yeah. me of Mother of just oh, how like you didn't expect for it to just take it to this next level and dryer goes there. And I thought it was unbelievable. Yeah, no, I mean, just quick aside, mother is, this movie is all over mother, right? I mean, it's all over mother. Mother's one of my favorite movies. I've seen that, you know, a dozen times maybe. Um, yeah. and anyways, this, the way he shoots this scene is, and the, the words, that he chooses from, you know, that the, from freedom <clears throat> comes her death, right? Her death, yep. So she's, she's free of all of this stuff when she, you know, gives herself over to the martyrdom. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not good for us though, right? It's not good for the townspeople. It's not good for the church. It can, right. it can be good for her, but in the long run, it ends up being, being good for the townspeople, I think. But yeah, no, it's he's he crafted something here that was pretty perfect. Um, I, I I can't really find any flaws in this scene, especially. I mean, this is I know we're not raking scenes over over these next hundred years, but this one will live with me for a while. So, yeah, no, me too, me too. Actually, um, yeah, we're not ranking scenes, but uh, uh, Premier Magazine did put this as the top movie in the history of film. Um, oh, okay. And that was that was done in uh, I think in the late two thousands, um, okay. or two thousand uh, late ten around that time. Um, okay. There's a lot of other you know you, you name it. This basically falls on every top film list a hundred years later. You know whether yeah. it's not top of it, but like within you know it's on the list, and it's a silent film and it's. A French film. It's an, you know what I mean? Like there's so many things that go against this and it basically, if you can get out of your way in your stigmas and your biases towards movies and watch mm. this, this, this masterpiece, cause it is a masterpiece in my eyes. Um, sure. I'm so glad we're doing this because just going back and watching this, like there's so many things I picked up now because I'm looking for it that just blow mm. my mind. And I'm like, this guy and even Carl Dreyer was looked at to be considered one of the greatest filmmakers to this day. Um, yeah. And maybe we'll fall on some other pieces of work of his. Maybe we won't. I don't know. But uh, I'm glad we came on this one. So Yeah, for sure. Totally um, agree. All right. So that did bring me to my big question. And not hard-hitting question, but my big question. Um, and you just alluded to it. And it's vague. But I kind of want to just say it to you. And I know we talked about me giving you some prep. But I want this one. This one was designed this way. Um, given off what you just said about what the townspeople, because I kind of had a similar thought, right? Yeah. 
I, 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 I make sure I word this correctly. I, I, I wrote down who's the hero of the movie. Mm. And I'm not sure that that's the right question. I guess maybe the more direct question is, is Joan of Arc a hero? Um, mm. And maybe that's too subjective, but like, I just wanted to ask it and you'd give me your thoughts. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I'm immediately reminded of uh, the line from interstellar when, um, Oh gosh, why am I blanking on his name? The grandpa. Why can't I think of his name? Michael Caine? No, not Michael Caine. The oh, grandpa. Let's go. Yes, let's go. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he has a line in that movie where he says, Don't trust the right thing done for the wrong reasons. Mm. And this is kind of the inverse here, where it's you can't you can trust, even though she might have the wrong premises, that she's arriving at the right conclusion. Because the conclusion here is not, you know, we, we're all going to hold hands in a nation of God. It's we're going to hold hands as a, as a people against tyranny, against oppression, against invaders. And um, I, think that she, I think that she's the hero of this movie and the hero of the story because she, she unites her people in this moment and in her trial in her steadfast belief even if i don't agree with where that belief's coming from she's arriving at the at the right conclusion that she you need to stand up against, uh, against the tyranny yeah. against the, well against the english in this in instance and um but against people who are trying to shape you in ways that you don't want to be shaped and um yeah no i definitely think that um, she's the hero of this story. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't quite, I asked the question to myself and I really couldn't quite, I mean, it, obviously the, the top surface feels like it, you know what I mean? Um, and if yeah. I had to give my answers of why I thought I could do that, cause I do think she is too, but it, I, mm -hmm. I knew there was something, there's like another level there that I, I, I couldn't quite get to. So, um, yeah. anything else? as far as the movie as a whole or uh, just maybe society as a whole or the conversation that you wanted to talk about earlier you alluded to uh let, let's bring it up now if we can oh you mean you mean god yeah <laughs> uh, the elephant in the room yeah, yeah. so i think i kind of just got to it right about what my belief is and that's just like um be good to each other um and like if what you believe gets you to that point you're okay in my book, right? I don't, if you, if you believe in God or if you believe in, um, you know, the version that has Jesus as a, a, a savior, um, or if you, you don't, but you still believe in God in a different way, like I'm, I'm happy for you. If that gets you to the right place, you know, which is, you know, we're all, we're all human. We all belong together working to solve problems. And, um, because there's big ones and, um, you know, and that's why this, this story is so powerful to me because like, it's not just that she believes she's hearing the voice of God. It's that she gets to the right place. Right. And that's, you know, that's, what's important to me. If this were a story about how she was hearing the voice of God and then, you know, went on a killing spree, like some people do yeah. when they hear the voice of God. Um, then I'd have more issues with it, but right. No, yeah, I think I, we're pretty I, much agreement on that. Yeah, no, we are. I, uh, I, I've been on, you know, other podcasts of mine having these conversations, you know, I, in the same, same type of realm. I know no more or less than you do. Um, mm -hmm. I, whatever helps you sleep at night and brings you peace within your mind, your authentic self. I want that for you. I just want to make sure that it doesn't hinder what, my peace of mind is and mm -hmm. and i think that's where the areas start getting kind of um gray is when they start hindering my liberties um and then even when they do because maybe it will uh can we come together and have a great discourse about it and a common you know find a common place rather than you're wrong i'm right vice, whatever that type of thing that's that's yeah. my initial place that's a vague answer of where i'm at but uh, I'm, 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 I'm aligned with you, my friend. Um, all right, you ready for some hard-hitting questions? Sure, let's do it. This first one will not make sense if you didn't catch it. If okay. you didn't catch it at all, 
then oh, no. I'm going to, this is going to go right over your head. Okay. But if you caught it, you're going to be like, oh my God, dude. Yes. All right, here we go. I'll just ask it. Hard hitting question number one. <coughs> Does Robert De Niro have a cameo in this movie? I missed it. <laughs> dude, oh, missed it. watch it back. Like the third judge, you okay. just, I can't unsee it. I can't unsee okay. it. To me, it was, it was uh, that thing that they do with uh, Bill Hader did with Arnold Schwarzenegger where they did face swap. Have you ever seen that video? Oh, no. oh my God, dude. He's no. on, you. he's on like Jimmy Kimmel and it's Bill okay. Hader doing an Arnold impersonation, but they actually put Arnold's face on him. It's hilarious. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I thought that's Uh-oh. what was happening. I thought it was Robert De Niro. Um, hard hitting question number two, and this is my last one. Okay. Did this film need more breastfeeding shots? <laughs> I was taken aback. I'll tell you that much. Um, it kind of <laughs> just came out of left field. It works really well. It does. I, I think I think it works really well. But um, man, it was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, because we we're, we're in this thing, and it's it's all happening so fast, and then all of a sudden, nipple, <laughs> milk, yep. baby. I'm like, oh, yep. all right, pause, type this up, let's go Glad back. I didn't watch this one with the kids. I don't think they're ready. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're ready for it either. Um, yeah, sounds like we both really enjoyed this film. Any lasting statements, anything that you want to uh, uh, recall before we kind of get to our next film? Um. <sighs> No, I, I think it's interesting <clears throat> that um, we've kind of watched two movies in a row now, you know, from 1928 that have, you know, I wouldn't call them like f- explicitly feminist um, because, you know, feminist is an idea, it, but it's still in its early stages at this point. Um, sure. But these are very, you know, feminist ideas. Um, and it's just interesting to me that I, I wasn't, expecting some of that and it's kind of i mean i'm happy to see it um i consider myself pretty feminist um but yeah no i I think that's the interesting part here is that these early movies that we're watching aren't necessarily what i was expecting um and i think uh, you know it'll be interesting to kind of track this right as we as we kind of move forward to see if there's some ebbs and flows we kind of talked about that on the first episode about how we'll probably see some revolution and counter revolution. Uh, and yep. I, I'm just curious to see how that goes here. Yeah, me too. Cause you're right. Uh, you know, with the, the circus and then this, there's, there's a great, uh, a great push for it, for those ideas. Um, mm-hmm. what year was the women's suffrage? 1919? Yes, I believe that's it. So we're 10 years yeah, after that. So, yeah, it's you know we're, these ideas have been obviously been around. Um, sure, I did want a couple. Uh, I did have a couple other just you know research notes that I think are worth noting. Um, the entire set was painted pink so that it would appear gray in black and white film to make the and mm. also to stand apart from what they wanted to believe the the, the white sky um, oh. to kind of give it some depth of field. And this is the big one. I got two more French nationalist nas- nationalists. They delayed the release of this film in France because they didn't like the idea of a Danish man who wasn't French nor Catholic telling the story. Also, there was a lot of scenes uh, taken out because um, the, the church didn't approve. So kind of going back to the power at that time. Um, okay. But here's the biggest one. Wait till you hear this one. I wanted to say okay. this to the end because we love this movie. Yeah. The original version of this film from the very beginning was destroyed in a fire. Oh. And every every scene, the the movie as we know it, are all of the rejected scenes that he had to oh, put wow. together to make a film. That's crazy. Think about that. That's, That's insane. That's insane. Now, we, we might not have seen that version, and I'm going to tell you why. That's the version that they seen from 1928 to 1981. In 1981, and this is the last one, uh, an original copy was found that they didn't know existed. 
at a uh, in a mental institution in a sane asylum, hmm. a buddy of Dreyer's was given an original copy to show people inside the mental asylum for whatever reason, and they found it in 1981, and that was the original copy. So we might have seen the original scenes, but think about that. For 60 years or 50 years, people thought this was still a masterpiece, and they saw all the rejected scenes. I just think that's incredible. Hmm. No, that's that's fascinating. Um, that's I don't even, I don't even know what to say. It's it's crazy to uh, crazy a uh, mental institution. Um, it's like a LeBron stat. It's one of those LeBron yeah. stats that are just like un, you can't. It's unreal to even think about. Yeah. No. For sure. So. All right, man. Uh, that was the Passion of Joan of Arc. It was 1928. Came out April 21st, I believe it was. Um, came to the states a little bit later. Um, sure. But that Gotta was when it was released the there. Exactly. Um, <laughs> all right. Our next film. This is where we come to, I believe, your first film that you you threw into the ringer here. Uh, came out in, I believe it was June. Am I correct? Am I, I got the right movie? Our Dancing Daughters. Is this the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I can't remember exactly when it came out, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the next one on the list. Yep, you're right. I got a number three here. Our Dancing Daughters. Yeah. So when you were looking this up, just real quick, uh, and I know we kind of talked about it during the draft, but uh, what are you excited about this film? What 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 gets you going? Yeah, I mean, um, I've grown to like uh, <clears throat> musicals uh, a little bit more as I've gotten older. Uh, I used to kind of reject them outright, like, oh, it's a musical. I'm, that's not for me. Um, but you know, I figured <laughs> since we're doing a history of film, this one might be important uh, to get a, a part. This one's part talky. If I'm remembering correctly, um, yep. you know, getting one of the first uh, films, one of the first musicals with talking, because uh, I'm assuming here that we're going to be seeing a little bit of dancing, unless you know they're just expert uh, metaphorologists. Um, but yeah, that that was one of the reasons. The other reasons was um, availability. I just wanted to make sure that I could actually watch some of the stuff I was choosing. So this was one of them. Uh, well, where can we watch it for those that are listening? Where can we uh, where can we pick this one up at? I'm pretty sure this one is uh, a rental from Apple TV. Um, I would imagine if it's on Apple, it'd probably also be available anywhere else you could rent, like Amazon or um, I think Google Play is probably another place you could find it. So, okay, okay. Well, just so everybody knows, it was directed by Harry Beaumont, but this is the movie that's going to introduce us, at least on our journey, to Joan Crawford. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. It came out in September 1st of 1928, runs about 85 minutes, and Wikipedia is telling me that it made uh, $1.1 million. So, uh, yeah, man, this is, uh, it, this is the film. I just read this. This is the film that launches the career of Joan Crawford. So we're going to actually be at the origin story of her as well, and I'm sure we'll come across some other films of hers um, throughout our journey here. So pretty excited about this. Sure. Plus, it'd be a nice kind yeah, of no. uh, nice kind of uh, mix up from what we've been watching, right? Like, I know we had a comedy, but this was a pretty thick movie we just watched. Pretty, pretty heavy. Oh yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It'll be it'll be a nice change of pace. So. All right. So. Well, for the rest of you guys, for me and Will, we'll see you guys here next week, and uh, just keep on watching movies. Cinema One Hundred. All right. We'll see you.